Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Godley filling in for Barbara Ham Lee. What is the role that African-American women have played in the space program? And now that NASA has launched the last space shuttle, what can we hope to achieve in the future? Do opportunities even exist today for those interested in the great beyond? And if so, what are they? Join us as we explore space with three women from three different generations who've been in the trenches. NASA pioneer Katherine Johnson, NASA engineer Monica Barnes, and Christina Chapman, a NASA intern. Another view is coming up next, right after this news from NPR. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African American community. This is Another View. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm Lisa Godley in for Barbara Ham Lee. The, songs you, the song you hear in the background is a very recognizable one. It's the theme to Star Trek. Today is the 42nd anniversary of the day the original Star Trek aired its final episode. One of my favorite characters from this fictional look at outer space is Lieutenant Uhura. Which got me thinking, in reality, what are the contributions African American women have made to the space program? We've heard the name Dr. Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman to go into space, and since her historic launch, there have been more, particularly working behind the scenes, making sure the Mae Jemisons get into space and return home safely. Joining me today are three women who've worked in the past or currently work with NASA. Katherine Johnson, a pioneer who worked with the Space Task Force before NASA was NASA. Katherine would do in her head what computers do today, and her calculations Calculations were so accurate that when NASA started using computers, the astronauts would ask what Catherine thought first. Also with us, Monica Barnes. Monica worked as a flight test engineer for NASA and Christina Chapman, a fifth-year biomedical engineering major at the University of Virginia who has already worked with NASA on several projects through her internships. Ladies, welcome to Another View. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Catherine, I understand you just celebrated your 93rd birthday, so I want to say happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> now, Catherine, your experience and knowledge of the space program is so vast, I can't wait for our listeners to hear from you. But before we get started, for those who have never heard the name Catherine Johnson, I want you to listen for just a minute as we take a quick look at the life and work of Catherine Johnson. Before there was electronic computers to do all the calculations, the NACA used to hire women who had degrees in mathematics. And it was thought that women would do it more accurately and pay more attention to the fine detail, and men wouldn't have the patience to do that. Katherine Johnson worked with the Space Orbital Mechanics Branch, and they asked her to calculate, you know, certain times when the rocket would have to fire and when they would launch the spacecraft away from the rocket and where she thought um, the spacecraft would actually land so they'd be able to recover it. She always told us that my grandfather, who only went to the sixth grade, was the smartest man she ever saw. And he could do numbers faster than you could bat your eye. So she started out, she said she used to count the plates and the silverware, and so she always loved numbers. And when she went to college, the professor had her and everything he taught her, she was just maxing. And he said, um, I think you'd make a good math researcher. And she said, well, what's that? He said, well, that's for you to find out. And so that was her dream from the beginning. She said, I want to be a research mathematician. We knew that she worked at Langley. Uh, it wasn't a discussion of what she did, we just knew it was math. And we all did well in math. She would never brag on herself. 
And most of our knowledge came from us seeing something and then coming home and saying, Mom, this book says you did A, B, and C. And that's basically how we started getting our own history of our mom and what she did. When they first uh, switched over to electronic computers, a lot of people, because they were so new, didn't trust the calculations that they produced. They would want a mathematician to check behind the computer until um, they gained some sort of credence here at the center. Presented to Katherine G. Johnson, this flag was carried aboard the fourth flight of Columbia in recognition of your personal contribution toward making space available. The awards that she has received have been many, but some of the most meaningful ones for her were the letters she would get from young school children. Uh, and one little girl called her long distance and after talking to her and all, she said, are you still alive? <laughs> because, you know, when you talk about people that you want to read about or do a project on, they're usually deceased. But she's 92 and still moving. And she said she never considered herself working. She loved what she did. She said it wasn't work. And she has enjoyed her life, truly. And she just celebrated her 93rd birthday. Catherine, when, when those students come to you and they ask you questions, is there a particular story that you like to share with them about your experiences with NASA and the state space program? No, Kathy just told you my favorite, <laughs> which was a little girl in the fourth grade and said, are you still living? <laughs> That's my favorite story. Okay, now I understand you, you got a call a, a while back when you were working with NASA from an astronaut in particular, and tell me a little bit about that story. When they transferred to the computer system, John Glenn called our office and asked for me. He wanted me to check the launch window that they were giving him. He said, if they get this, you give me the same numbers they do, I'll go with their stuff. And I spent a day rechecking, and we agreed. So then they did, they did decide that the computer was okay. <laughs> they decided that the computer was okay. All right. Well, Monica Barnes, thank you for being here. Thank this you. This morning. Glad you, to be here. And you've worked with NASA over 20 years. Yes. And you've worked as an engineer. Yes. So tell me a little bit about your involvement. Well, I've worked at NASA. I started out um, as a cooperative education student. And that was, we would go to school and I went attended Virginia Tech and we would come home and work uh, during the summer and during the winter months. And we would go back and forth and basically I earned my degree uh, with two years of education, uh, of work experience along with my education. And I came to be involved with NASA Langley through um, the cooperative uh, education program, but initially um, as an interested student in math and science, and I decided to pursue that career in engineering. Okay. All righty, Christina Chapman. Yes. I just found out this morning that um, I grew up with your dad. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, My tell us, out, yeah, out in Cedar Grove in Chesapeake, tell me a little bit about um, your involvement with uh, NASA. Well, I um, have been interning in the Langley Aerospace Research Summer Scholars Program for about the last four summers, and I got involved when I was going into my um, or going into my first year of college. And I ended up getting involved because my um, my father, Michael Chapman, he actually um, works at NASA, and he was also very involved in the National Technical Association. So when we were younger, my brother and I were always in like different like math competitions and different. Um, activities that help encourage students to go into the STEM field. So through that and then following my brother into the NASA internships, that's how I became involved. And I loved it. So I've just been involved since. Was there any particular project that you worked on that just really got your gears going? Um, actually, that first year that I interned, I ended up working in the Advanced Systems and Optical Measurement Branch under um, Ken Wright and Danny Burroughs. And I worked on the crew exploration vehicle. 
that was back when they were going, thinking that it was going to land in the desert. So they were testing two different types of airbags to see which would be the best. And I was able to be involved in that process, that project, analyzing data and doing photogrammetric analysis. So that, that's really what interested me in staying with NASA and actually kind of cemented my career field of being an engineer. Okay, already. Thank you. Catherine, I'm, I'm curious to ask you about, you see the, the different jobs that women are doing at NASA. What are your thoughts about all the different things that women are doing at NASA today? Our theory is that if a man can do it, a woman can do it also. <laughs> okay, well, I agree with you with that. Your your thoughts now on um, where where things should go, or what anything else you would like to see as a pioneer with the program? No, I would just like to see them proceed as they always have. NASA was very independent at one time, and engineers could go in any direction they wanted to and <clears throat> do their research. Then. Congress or somebody started telling them what to do, and it, it affected their attitude. But nevertheless, I have the greatest confidence in this. I think there's no place like it to work or to have to listen to. Okay. All righty. We're interested in your comments. Give us a call at 440-2665, or you can give us a call at 1-800-940-2240. Now, Monica, tell me a little bit about what you're doing now. You told us what you were doing as an engineer. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing now with development. Well, what I'm doing now is I'm actually one of the partnership development managers for the Strategic Relationships Office. And we actually go out and find a new business for NASA, reimbursable work, have people come in to utilize our facilities for research, um, testing, um, and various applications um, that they want to with private industry, as well as other government, as well as academia. So I work with lots of different clients. Um, and we also um, help to develop new um, and innovative work through our creativity and innovation design team. Uh, one of the most exciting things that I've done recently is to be a part of the creative uh, creativity and innovation de design team. We designed a course called Enhancing Your Creative Genius in order to um, help our NASA uh, people to be even more creative than we are. We are NASA Langley. We are the mother center. We are the ones that were there first, uh, the original astronauts trained um, at NASA. And we want to create a, a future that is um, bright and exciting. Um, and we're looking forward to being able to do that through younger uh, people as well and through the work that we're doing now. Okay. All righty. Christina, your dream job, if you had your dream job, what would that be? My dream job would be to, I'm very big in like being able to see like the starting point and going to the end and basically what you're working on seeing an app, like a real world application for it. So my dream job would be able to combine aerospace and biomedical engineering to pretty much be able to help develop like the life um, systems and things on the International Space Station and going into deep space. So, okay. And what kind of what kind of classes? You're a student at the University of Virginia. What kind of classes are you taking to prepare you? I know you're getting a lot of experience working as an intern, but what type of um, classes are you taking to prepare you for that? Um, well, currently I'm taking a biomaterials course. I'm also taking some classes in electrical engineering. And um, a course that I've just started is called Systems Biology, which basically kind of teaches you how to take data and make a computational model out of it. And that's extremely helpful because you can use computational models for pretty much anything, and they can help you figure out what will actually happen in the real situation. So that's currently what I'm taking. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Catherine, what, what do you advise um, young people as far as things they should study? Um, math, science, what are, you, what are your suggestions, somebody who's been there and, and done that? Well, I just suggest a good basic course in uh, mathematics should be followed from the fourth grade on so that you are comfortable with numbers and uh, can proceed in that manner. It's, 
it's important that you're comfortable when you're working with something that you like. And uh, as everybody knows, I really like numbers. But uh, just to follow uh, any any uh, course that follows in any any college, they they run you through the geometries and the analytic geometry, et cetera, et cetera, and then on up into higher mathematics. And uh, then you're prepared to go in any direction. It's it's no specific direction. I've got you. Okay, I understand. We have Julie from Norfolk on line one. Julie's mother, who's also in her 90s, worked with NASA. Julie, what did your mom do? Well, my mother was a computer like Catherine, I, I learned um, after my mother passed away, they called the ladies computers um, before we had the mechanical or electronic computers of today. Right. So um, her name was Frances Hill, and I was just wondering if Catherine worked together with my mother. I don't think so. I was okay. in the pool only a couple of weeks before I went to the flight mechanics branch and stayed there. Okay. Well, and and you stayed at Langley for 33 years. Okay, and so my father was Paul Hill um, there, and I knew also um, Hewitt Phillips and um, oh, Howard yes, Edwards. Mr. Mr. Phillips was my branch. Division. Okay, and his daughter was my best friend through school, so I grew up with the Phillips family more or less. But I knew you must at least know or have worked with uh, Hewitt Phillips. And it is just so nice to talk to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. All righty. Thank you. I'm glad there were a connection was made there. Monica, what are some of the um, other jobs that are available um, that people can pursue in, in at NASA? Well, at NASA, there are many different jobs. And it's so funny because Christina said she kind of followed her brother. She kind of brought up those memories with me. I actually followed my brother uh, there as well. He was a co-op student before I was in uh, mechanical engineering. And our father uh, basically told us since we were so good in math and science that we would be uh, great in engineering. And my father's Oliver Hunter and Evelyn Hunter uh, out of uh, Chesapeake. And so we basically went into um, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering at first to just explore, you know, different things that we would be able to go into, maybe um, computer engineering or aerospace, or I wasn't quite sure exactly which um, field I wanted to go into. But electrical engineering um, is basically a type of engineering that you can go into where you can go into almost any field. And you can go in further into mathematics or science or branch out into um, all types of different engineering. My master's is actually in engineering management Mm -hmm. um, from Old Dominion University. And um, that kind of allowed another expansion into the business area. So you can go into many different fields of engineering as well as um, any of the science or technological fields um, in addition to engineering, math, and science, as well as um, some of the other um, students that may or may not want to go into engineering can go into support fields, which are um, the engineering technicians, as well as uh, computer um, uh, development. Um, There are many different fields, Uh, as well as we have a lot of of our support uh, systems with accounting and le- the legal field because we have to know how to transfer our technology out and we need people to be able to uh, develop, uh, look at the patents um, and verify those and get those out into industry. Also, um, our organization at NASA, the Strategic Relationships Office, is very um multi-purpose in that we have several different um, arenas. We have partnership development in our office. Uh, We also have uh, the legislative affairs. We also have the news media. And um, I'm being accompanied today by (laughs) Kathy Barnstoff, who is with the news media as well. Um, And we also have um, um, the strategic um, arm as well as our technology transfer. We have um, many different um, areas that are in in coordination with what we're developing for the future. So we have the uh, creativity and innovation team is led also out of our, our branch. And we're really into kind of try to create um, different ways for people to be able to expand um, not only what NASA does, you know, here at Langley, but 
far beyond those gates and we want to innovate into the future and beyond not just nasa langley but uh throughout the agency okay all righty now you followed somebody or w was influenced by somebody else who worked at, at nasa and so was christina uh catherine i'm curious did any of your children follow in your footsteps in terms of the math and science interest well they are all teachers at one time. One of them particularly, though, went into uh, mathematics itself, and she worked for uh, several companies doing something of the sort. In particular, though, she wound up with the, uh, I can't remember which one, in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. But she stayed in the field of math. The others branched out into teaching whatever was given to them to teach. Okay, all righty. Um, Christina. Yes. <laughs> all righty. Now, tell me about your first, when you went in, talk to us a little bit about the LARS program. First, give me what that acronym is all about and tell me a little bit about what, what goes on there. Well, LAR stands for Langley Aerospace Research Summer Scholars um, Program, and it's one of the um, oldest um, internships that NASA offers it's at NASA Langley, and it's pretty much just a program that tries to get people of, like, high school students, college students, and graduate students just into NASA to work on many different projects and pretty much just see how your work is really going to influence real life, which is one of the reasons I really liked it. They also... But within that program, they make sure that you're not just kind of stuck in your own research. So they offer tours and lectures that help you, like, branch out and learn about what the center and just NASA's mission um, is overall. They also offer networking um, opportunities in terms of, like, etiquette luncheons and letting you meet, like, higher-up officials and people in different departments. So it's more of – it's not only just giving the students, like, a good educational experience, but it's also trying to prepare you professionally for the rest of your life and to stay in the NASA pipeline. So, I mean, I would definitely recommend any student to, to try it out. It's a great internship. Okay, great. Now, I, I know that you um, said your, your dad and some other folks, um, you kind of followed in their footstep, but was there one in particular thing that, that inspired you to, to follow this particular track? it was one thing in particular my parents have kind of always like pushed my brother and I into like definitely pursuing um education and to the STEM field so I've just kind of had that upbringing and then the internship experiences that I've had have just been wonderful and I honestly couldn't have asked for anything better so that's kind of just has curved my interest Okay, thank you so much. Monica, how about you? Anything in particular that said, this is definitely what I want to do? Well, one of the things was when I was in high school, um, in between the 11th and 12th grade, I was able to attend a minority introduction to engineering um, two-week residential course up at Virginia Tech. And that kind of really um, exposed us to well, very much like Christina, um, different people, uh, different um, aspects of engineering and what I wanted to do better. And then um, I would say one of the larger influences was also my mother and father, um, as well as um, my brother going into engineering. I had several mentors, um, well, kind of mentors from afar. Um, with one of them was Christine Darden. I know you remember her, Miss, Miss Catherine. And oh, also yeah. um, uh, Rosa Webster, who used to be at NASA as well. And she was actually, I met her through my sorority. Mm. And she's a Delta Sigma Theta, oh. so um, so she's a Delta. And we actually, she actually got the application for uh, me to go into uh, engineering and go into the co-op program. So uh, being part of the cooperative education program was really exciting to have. Um, as a matter of fact, Christina's father, Mike Chapman, was one of my mentors as well okay. for the cooperative education program. And being exposed to all those different um, aspects of NASA really helped to shape um, the fact that, you know, you do make a difference and you can apply technology in a way that, you you know, was never done before. You can improve technology to the point where, you know, it can be really useful in a different way. So I think that had a large influence over um, my selecting engineering and sticking it out. 
because um, it was a tough field. Um, going to Virginia Tech, actually, um, I was one of three black female engineers to first graduate from electrical engineering at Tech, and that was in 86. So wow. we've come a long way in engineering. Okay. And Alrighty. females. Thank you so much. Give us a call, 440-2665, or you can call us at 1-800-940-2240. We'll be back with NASA pioneer Katherine Johnson, NASA engineer Monica Barnes, and newcomer Christine Chapman right after this. Welcome back. We're talking about the contributions that African American women have made to the space program. And in this half hour, we'll be looking at the role they may play in the future. Ladies, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> now, I know um, my thoughts when I saw uh, Mae Jemison um, go up in space. Tell me a little bit about uh, your thoughts about that. Well, I. Uh, thought that it was really amazing, first of all, to see an African American woman going into space. And um, I just felt that she was creating, you know, a pathway for many people to follow, just as so many of us, especially uh, women like Miss Katherine Johnson, have, you know, were trailblazers in the field. And creating that um, just you know, it gives you a sense of belonging in mm -hmm. um, the fact that you are able to see someone to go before you and you know that you can do it. It just really was very encouraging to see her um, and to, you know, create that pathway for many different women, uh, which is, is part of what we all want to do and make a difference for other women. Okay. I know um, there have been three I think and one is in training now um, to be an astronaut. I don't know what that's going to do with everything that has happened lately, but um, we're looking forward to seeing where things go. Um, Jolette is calling us from New Jersey, and this is Catherine's daughter online, too. Hello. How are uh, you doing? I I'm good, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Hi. Just wanted to... Uh, Add a couple comments. Uh, you spoke to my other sister, but I majored in math at Hampton. Okay. And I went to NASA for about a year and a half until my husband and I moved uh, up up north, as we say. Uh, so I got a little bit of what she was doing. We actually even took an engineering course together once. But um, it was always a pleasure. Math was always positive in our house. And uh, I think for children today, if they don't hear their parents say math is hard, they will at least try. And the other thing that I think is also important is that music is a very good, um, let's say, support thing for people who are interested in math and numbers. And that we had also, both of us, all of us are musicians of some sort as well. And I just wanted to say hello to everybody. Christine Darden was my classmate and mm. sorority mate. At, always connections. Uh, yes. Six always, degrees of separation. Always. Right, right. And uh, she stayed and I moved there and I moved into programming. And uh, mom was trying to remember I was at uh, Lockheed Martin when I retired uh, on probably 10 years ago now. So just wanted to add a little bit of color in there. Well, Jolette, I have a question for you before sure. you hang up. Now, the young people in, in your life that you've influenced, have any of them gone into the math and science field as well, watching you and your mother? Well, my son majored in math four times, but he, it was always, in fact, he, he taught math, he te taught math in elementary school. So we just have, uh, we have some influence because we're always talking positively about math. You, you just hear so many people say, 
it's hard, it's hard, and it's just because they don't try or because somebody else told them it was hard. And uh, we must make our children more interested. And um, as my mother said, I think in an earlier interview on your station, that we have to make the children want to learn. And in doing so and giving them a challenge, our children can learn just as much as anybody else, and we just need to challenge them because they're smart. And if you don't challenge them, then they'll get in trouble. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Thank you so much for that call, Jillette. I really appreciate your calling in. We have Paul on line three from Norfolk. Paul? Hey, hello there. How are you? I'm doing great. No thanks to you guys. (laughs) Or thanks to you guys, I should say. Oh, Um, okay. What did we do to help you? (laughs) I want to thank NASA specifically, but I never get to thank people in NASA uh, for all that they have done for everybody else in the world. Everybody thinks NASA works for astronauts and stuff, but I'm a firefighter. Okay. When I started as a firefighter, we didn't have air masks. This is back in the 60s. Right. We had canvas coats. (laughs) Ooh. We had canvas and rubber hoses. We had no decent radios at all. And when I retired in 1998... We had, uh, well, um, trunking radios that you could Mm -hmm. talk to anybody in the world on. We had defibrillators in our fire engines. We had telemetry. We could talk to doctors. We wear Nomex coats. We're wearing breathing apparatus that is state-of-the-art. I can can survive in 800-degree temperatures for 20 minutes with the gear that we have nowadays. That's a good thing. I, I... Thank NASA every day for making my life possible. And I wanted you guys to know that and all the hard work that you went through and put in. It does have real-world applications. Thank you so much, Paul. We really appreciate that call. Monica, I see you shaking your head and smiling. What's going on? I'm smiling because he's um, one of the beneficiaries of our uh, technology transfer. As a matter of fact, that's another area in our office where we talk about the NASA spinoffs. And there's a lot of... Technology that is spun off from NASA that um, is to the benefit of all of mankind. One of them being the flame re- retardant uh, um, suits that firefighters, firefighters yeah. use. Mm-hmm. So that's exactly right. And some of them being, you know, even you know, like you said, the breathing apparatus. Uh, there were, have been many different um, spinoffs to uh, develop um, filters so that they can filter out bacteria as well as. Um, you know, filter the air as well as water and all kinds of filters that have been developed from NASA technology that are used in automotive uh, industries as well as firefighting and, um, you know, um, emergency applications. Um, the defibrillator mm-hmm. um, is one of the NASA spinoffs. We even have done some things in the biomedical field like Christina is in, um, like the fetal heart monitor. And um, actually here recently, uh, my mother um, uh, was experienced um, some benefit from that from the pacemaker, wow, uh, one of okay. the leads, uh, one of the lead uh, developers of the leads on the end of a pacemaker is actually at NASA Langley. And also, um, if you've heard before, some of the spinoff technologies that we've developed, we just did a large event in New York City called What's Your Favorite Space um, that – um, helped celebrate um, the shuttle mm-hmm. um, astronauts as well as um, just people finding their favorite space and and what they enjoy as as far as uh, NASA technology goes. So there's many different technologies that have been um, invented that are benefiting mankind. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I understand. I have Michael Chapman from Hampton on line four. Michael, how are you doing? I'm fine, Lisa. How are you? <laughs> I'm just great. Your daughter is lovely. Thank you very much. Oh, and I just you. want to say hello to her and Catherine and Monica. I've worked with all of them. <laughs> <Dog>. <laughs> At one time or another, Monica and I actually work together now. Yes. Okay. All righty. What, is, what, is, what are your thoughts? What do you tell young people that might be thinking about a career there? Well, I'll just amplify uh, some of what Catherine said and also Tina. It's very important to get kids, male and female, interested in science and math and engineering and technology, anything in the STEM field as early as possible. I mean, elementary school, fourth grade, fifth grade, and on up. 
And as parents, we really can't allow our kids to say, this is too hard or I don't think I want to do that. You've got to make them try because they don't know what the possibilities are. They don't know what the opportunities are. They don't know how easy it can be uh, if they give up too soon. And so we've got to push them in that direction. There's really no alternative in today's world. It's all science and math and computer-based, and you, you won't survive unless you have a, a good foundation in that. So we've got to push that early, early, and, 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 uh, and do it uh, continuously. Michael, I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm I'm in and out of the schools a lot for different reasons, and I talk to a lot of the younger kids, and and the first thing you hear them say is math is just too hard, and they you know I I know I can't do this, and and I and I want to hear from all of you actually on what you tell children when they're when they're in that particular if you see that they're struggling and this is not something that they think that they can do. Yeah, well, you know, take that line from that uh, Apollo 13 movie or wherever it is from you know failure is not an option you got to do well in it i mean you're playing ipods and and xbox 360 and all these things you know all this technology is in in these little chips in these little pieces of plastic that we use every day cell phones gps systems uh, somebody's got to uh continue to make those inventions and and those innovations and uh you just it's not enough just to know how to operate it you got to know what's inside and and so no, you can't. You can't give up. You can't fail. You got to uh, go ahead and take the coursework, and it'll click. You just got to give it time and put good effort into it. And that's what we got to instill in our kids. Okay, um, I'll start with Monica since she's smiling. You, uh, or I should say, continue with Monica. <laughs> I was just gonna say that you know um, sometimes you know they just don't know that they're interested. Um, programs like the uh, Lars program and other student education programs, that's another large part of a, what our organization does. Educating the students as to what we, um, what we have and giving them kind of an experiential, um, you, know, uh, you know, something that they can touch, feel, see, do. That's a part of a lot of what we do. And um, we do have um, the NASA Speakers Bureau that goes out and we talk to the students to try to get them to be more interested in to be exposed to what we do on a, an experiential level. And that way they can be more involved. And that kind of spurs the different interests that they didn't know necessarily existed. So that's really exciting um, to be able to see that transformation when they can, you know, delve into the experiment part and just not be, you know, just go strictly off of the math or the science or what they think they aren't interested in. But if you can, allow them to experience some of the applications of technology, they sometimes change to change their minds and become interested right away. Okay. All righty. Do you think it has something to do with the types of learners that children are, whether they're visual learners or, you know, just based on what kind of learner they are, whether I think, they grasp onto something like that? I think that as much as we can expose them to, whether they're auditory, visual, or kinesthetic learners, that if they can immerse into an experiment like that or an educational experience um, in that way that they will become a lot more interested. Um, that's part of um, what uh, internships and uh, the various programs, uh, summer camps, all of those things that we have uh, offered to them. That's part of what they are. Uh, we have the Summer of Innovation programs. We have Inspire. Uh, we have many different student programs, um, especially through our partner organization, the Virginia Air and Space Center as well, um, that deal a lot with the um, with children and, and exposing them at a very young age as to what the possibilities are in a STEM, you know, field in science, technology, engineering, or math. Okay. Christina, you just graduated from high school. Um, well, a lot closer to it than me. Um, you know, a lot of younger people. Wh what do you think about that? when a young person says it, math, science, you know, that's great for you, but this is stuff, this stuff is too hard. What do you tell them? I tell them to again keep trying. Like I know, I know from personal experience. Like you might not get the concepts at first, but one thing with math is it does get easier the more you practice. And I do think a lot of times, like my dad said, people get discouraged before putting in enough effort for the concepts to come quickly. Also, I honestly, I think a lot of times it's how you get the child interested in math and science. Like I, I'm more of a hands-on person. So when I learned how to, like, build a rocket, so I got to see different science experiments and chemistry experiments, that's what really interested me. It wasn't always just, like, listening to some 
to listening to like a lecture or something like that. It was I saw what I could do with it. So I was more inclined to put in the work to learn the background behind it, like learn how these mathematical equations actually translate to different things happening. So I think if you can spark a child's interest, then they will be more willing to do all the background work to understand how all these things work. Okay, thank you so much. Catherine, you want to add something to this? Well, I did want to say that back to the ordinary. The people at NASA uh, and space program have done much for the uh, camera people. Instant replay, for example, the fact that they can uh, photograph anything that they need to have photographed. All of this is a result of NASA's work in uh, promoting the system of uh, I'm thinking particularly in terms of sports, the fact that they use the uh, cameras for instant replay. I right this minute my forgettery comes forth and it overtakes my memory. But uh, so much has been done in terms of photography, in terms of uh, recording in terms of keeping up with what is going on. All of this can be traced back to something that was done at NASA or in the space, in the space program. It is so far reaching, I, I just can't describe it. But math is the basis for much of living. That's well, so well said. Michael, thank you for calling. And I am going to talk to Daniel from Hampton on line one. Daniel, what would you like to add? Yeah, um, when I, I took uh, math in high school. I'm a black person also, but not that blackness has anything to do with this conversation. <laughs> but I think it does. We're not talking about blackness and everything too much. But, uh, yeah, I took math in high school. Uh, I, I took uh, algebra. And I was told that if you don't pass algebra, you will not graduate high school. But I did not pass algebra, and I still graduated high school. And my ma math teacher did not help me, and he didn't care, and blah, blah, so on and so forth. But I think people need to understand a sort of, an, this, just like with history, people need to recognize a uh, practical application before that, and I, I, people have said that before me, like what the practical application is as far as mathematics and everything, but if you're going to try to interest students, you need to let them know how mathematics or history and all that kind of stuff influences their daily life. Oh, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly, Daniel. Thank you so much for calling. We're going to talk to Catherine, who's the namesake of Catherine Johnson on line three. Catherine, how are you? Hello, how are you, Lisa? I'm just fine. Good. Did you call hi. to talk to Mom? Uh, hi, Mom. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Miss Chapman. Hi. And the other guests you have, there's hi, a connection hi. with all of them. Yes, Because hello. I know Michael used to bring his daughter over to Mom sometimes. But I wanted to piggyback on the young man that just talked. Teachers are key, just like parents are key. And the expectations of teachers is so important. If you expect nothing, my mother always says, you get nothing. And we played games from early on that had to do with numbers, Chinese checkers, checkers. You had to think, and you had to strategize. And if you play games with children early... They learned that math, as the young man says, becomes a part of everyday life, not something special that if you don't pass it, you don't graduate. I do wholeheartedly agree that if you start early, our kids can get to the moon. Thank you so oh, much for analogy. all that you do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just keep doing what you're doing. Well, thank you so much. We're going to do that. We are just going to do that. I'm curious to um, everyone, 
right now. And Monica, since you're sitting here with such a great big smile, I want to know where would you like to see the space program go? Well, right now, I'd love to see us to be able to um, expand beyond um, the government. What we'd like to do is turn over um, kind of to private industry uh, the development of um, the next man you know, vehicle to go. Um, what we like to do is uh, create those jobs and those uh, opportunities for private industry to be able to get more people involved um, in creating the next, you know, big wow, uh, the next vehicle. We've celebrated, just came off of celebrating 30 years with the space shuttle in a fantastic program um, that was very, very uh, beneficial to all who's, who were involved. But it is time to move forward to make way for a different way to do business and to be able to, you know, compete uh, globally and um, internationally, uh, develop more collaborations uh, between uh, the various uh, nations as well as uh, in allowing a private industry to develop some of those. And we want to go beyond lower Earth orbit. We want to go uh, beyond that, as you know, as the Star Trek theme says, uh, you know, to to well beyond. Right. Um, we'd like to see uh, developing, um, n- you know, smarter, uh, smarter technology as far as robotics and automated systems go. We'd like to also go in that direction. I think that that would be uh, also wonderful. And also creating those opportunities for uh, students to be able to um, get into more of the science, technology, engineering, and math. That's going to take our whole world in another direction. Um, and I think that those types of um, innovations are, are what's needed for us today and in the future. How long do you think it'll take us? And I know you're like, I don't know. How long do you think it'll take us to get to Mars? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We have a lot of technology that is, uh, well, you know, uh, something that can be developed into uh, taking us well beyond the current atmosphere into Mars and beyond. And we do ha- uh, have things under development right now um, that, you know, can can do that. So I'm, I don't know, predict within, you know, the next certainly five, ten years, maybe. Um, it just depends on how bright the students are and Who's coming up with the next big wow? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of bright students, Christina, where would you like to see the space or like to see space exploration go? I would love to see. I would love to see us explore um, deep space and go to different planets. I just think that would be so interesting just to see what else is out there. Um, as far as like, I would also really like to see the space program like continue to excite like younger people and just like. America and the world in general, because there's just, especially like um, when the space race and things are going on, like so many people know about NASA and we're supporting the program and things like that. And I would just like to see that energy continue because that's really what gets people excited and gets people wanting to accomplish these um, further out goals. So. Okay, Catherine, where would you like to see space exploration go? My statement there is, and answers people and say, well, why do you want to do so? Because it's there. <laughs> we want to see what's out there. And uh, I, I'm very interested in yeah, going to Mars, to Jupiter, and uh, further explore space simply because it's there. That would be nice to see how far we could go, huh? <laughs> Again. I said that would be nice to see just how far we could go. Yes. <laughs> now you've you've wa- you've witnessed some launches, haven't you? No, but <laughs> I have been given a, a tour of the area. Oh, okay. It's just interesting to see what can be done. Okay. All right. Yes, it would. Very interesting to see what can be done. Chris, Christina. <laughs> have you <Bye>. been, <laughs> have you been able to witness any launches? Um, yes, actually, I got to see the last one. I ended up attending um, the STS-135 conference, and it was amazing. I'm so glad I was able to see that. So. And, you can and talk hopefully about- I'll get to see the next space launch that happens, too. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, ladies, all I can say is thank you so much for being a part of today's discussion. Catherine Johnson, as always, it is such an honor to talk to you. 
Thank you. Monica Barnes, thank you so much. You're so welcome. I'm glad to be here. It has been my absolute pleasure having you here. And Christina Chapman, make it a great thank year now. We're looking forward to hearing some great things from you. I will definitely let you know what, my, what I'm doing in the future. Hi, <laughs> Tina. Hi, Miss Johnson. How are you? I'm great. All of us, uh, Monica and Christina, we're all going to have to come over, Catherine, and have tea with you one afternoon. Please. please <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Anytime. Sounds fantastic. We are absolutely looking forward to that. And another view. We'll be right back. If you're looking for something to do, be sure to check out the community calendar on our website at anotherviewradio.org. Our pick of the week comes courtesy of the NSU Honors College Lecture Series. Now, this coming Thursday evening at 7 p.m., author and lawyer Michelle Alexander will discuss her book, The New Jim Crow, a look at mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness. Just to give you a little tease, I'll read a short passage from her book that really stuck with me. Jarvius Cotton's family tree tells the story of several generations of black men who were born in the United States but who were denied the most basic freedom that democracy promises, the freedom to vote for those who will make the rules that governs, govern one's life. Cotton's great-great-grandfather could not vote as a slave. His great-grandfather was beaten to death by the Ku Klux Klan for attempting to vote. His grandfather was prevented from voting by Klan, Klan intimidation, and his father was barred from voting by poll taxes and literacy tests. Today, Jarvius Cotton cannot vote because he, like many black men in the United States, has been labeled a felon and is currently on parole. Be at Norfolk State University next week when Michelle Alexander discusses racial disparities, particularly when it comes to the American penal system. Her book, The New Jim Crow, is a fascinating read and is sure to spark engaging discussion. She'll be in town next Thursday, September 8th at 7 p.m. in the L. Douglas Wilder Performing Arts Center on the NSU campus. Now, if you're a regular Another View listener or if you've just tuned in for the very first time, we'd love to hear from you. Please check out our website at anotherviewradio.org. There you can sign up for our e-newsletter. It's a once-a-week reminder of upcoming shows. You can also listen to the podcast or any of our past shows. And you can send us a note to tell us how we're doing. We're also on Facebook, so friend us. Next Friday is the second Friday of the month, and that means that our always exciting and electrifying editorial roundtable will be here in the studio. Join them as host Barbara Ham Lee as they discuss the hot topics of the day. I'm Lisa Godley. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time for another view. 